recording. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Uh, the four in plus two rule. Uh, so we have a question while we're waiting. I want to wait a couple more minutes, hopefully get around 15, 16 before we start on our last section of spectroscopy. But the four in plus two rule is the number of pi electrons you have to have to become an aromatic compound, okay? So <clears throat> um, in the 4n plus 2 rule, n has to be any integer, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Where that number comes from isn't important. The fact is that it has to be a multiple of those to be aromatic, which means if n is equal to 0, that means 0 times 4 plus 2 means you can have an aromatic system if you have two electrons in a set of three pi orbitals in a ring. So there are four requirements for aromaticity. Actually, here, let me stop sharing for just a second so you can watch me wave my hands. Okay, so we have four requirements for aromaticity. One is it has to be a ring, okay? It has to have p orbitals. Okay, which means the rest of the atoms have to be sp hybridized or sp2 hybridized, but they have to have at least one p orbital available to it. Then it has to have that right number of electrons, the 4n plus 2 rule. Okay, and all of those p or orbitals have to overlap, which makes the need for it to be planar. Most of the time, you can tell if something's planar because smaller rings like six and below, if you have alternating single and double bonds, that makes them sp2 hybridized, which makes them uh, tend to be that uh, trigonal planar structure anyway. So they're going to try to lay out in a flat ring. So <clears throat> once you once you go above six, like when you have seven, now you start to be able to maybe not have those sp3 hybridized, those sp2 hybridized trigonal planar in a flat ring. So in rings above seven, you have an opportunity for it not to be planar. Now, there is an opportunity to have large multi-ringed systems. So we have a five-membered ring and a six-membered ring and a five-membered ring all fused together. Those tend to be planar because a three-membered ring, a four-membered ring, a five-membered ring, with double bonds, a six-membered ring with double bonds, and a seven-membered ring with double bonds tends to get close to planar. Outside of seven, we start to see if the ring is that many atoms big and there's not kind of a, a, a multi-ring system, those tend to not be planar. Okay, so our four things for aromaticity are p orbitals, have a ring, be planar. The reason it has to be planar is you need those p orbitals to overlap uh, nicely, and then that number of electrons. So if you don't want to remember the idea that you have to calculate the 4n plus 2, you can also just remember that if n is 0, that means we have two electrons to make it aromatic, six electrons to make it aromatic, or 10 electrons to make it aromatic. Okay, so that's how that rule works. Does that answer the question about the 4n plus 2 rule? And did that also answer the question about planarity? Okay, great. All right, uh, we have 16 participants. That's our critical mass. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. And we're gonna take on that last section of chapter 11, which is spectroscopy, specifically carbon-13 spectroscopy, okay? So from our previous talk, we had to look at our proton NMR or our hydrogen NMR, and we had four things to look for. And we use that acronym SPIN to make it happen, where we have the number of peaks, the intensity of the peaks, the position of the peaks, and the splitting of the peaks, okay? When we look at this carbon-13 NMR, because of the fact that carbon-13 is only a minor isotope of carbon, the major isotope is called carbon-12, which has six protons and six neutrons. When it has six protons and six neutrons, that means there's not an unpaired spin in the nucleus, and therefore it's NMR inactive. 
we, meaning we can't pulse it with radio waves and have it respond to us. So that's why the isomer of carbon-13, which has one more neutron, allows it to have that neutron not be spin paired, and we can actually flip it up and down using radio frequency and be able to see it, okay? The problem with that is that uh, the natural abundance of carbon-13 is much, much lower. It's only 1.1% of all carbon is the carbon-13. Therefore, we don't have as many of those carbons available to us to do the spectroscopy. And because that not having as many uh, carbons to do spectroscopy, we will not see splitting because, so our split goes away, the S of the spin goes away because you rarely have two carbon 13s next to each other. Only those two carbon 13s that would be spin active can spin split each other. Therefore, because we have so few of these, we do not see splitting, okay? Uh, okay, I'm reading a question. All right, yeah, I can answer that question. Let me get through this and then we'll have a period of time after that. Is that okay? Uh, Celeste has a question for everybody in the thing. All right, great. All right, uh, so this is actually a shorter section, so we will have time to talk about this, okay? Okay, so because there's so few of these carbon 13s next to each other, we don't have to worry about splitting anymore, okay? Now, the other thing we have associated with it is because we have so few of them, we can't properly figure out our intensity, okay? So because, again, we have only 1.1% of these that are there, we do not get splitting and we cannot measure intensity, which takes us down to two things which is the number of signals and the position, okay? So we really only look for two things in carbon-13 NMR. So just like in the hydrogen NMR or the proton NMR, H1, is that we're looking for non-equivalent carbons. So we have to look for what we're called, um, you know, we're looking for symmetry. We're looking for the same bond-bond connections, just like in the hydrogen NMR, where we have to look three and four bonds over to see that they look the same by the number of connections. We do that exact same thing with carbon. And so a methyl group at the end of a chain, those are going to start to look like each other. Uh, but when a carbon has two things bonded to it, or three things bonded to it, or four things bonded to it, it does two things. It makes it unique and hopefully different from other carbons, and it changes the position where it shows up in our spectrum, okay? So uh, most of the time, um, what we do is we do what we call a hydrogen decoupled, which means that the carbon-13 signals actually do kind of interact with the hydrogen signals. However, we can use special frequencies to get rid of the hydrogen interaction, and therefore we only see one signal for each unique type of carbon. So again, carbon-13 is simplified from the four things we look for in hydrogen NMR to the two things we look in carbon NMR, which is unique number of carbons and their position, okay? So let's talk about that a little bit. So uh, all of these examples are what we call hydrogen decoupled, meaning if you have one kind of carbon, you're gonna get one kind of Um, peak. Okay, so let's blow this structure up and look at the different kind of carbons and make sure that they're different in our heads. Okay, so the first thing I want to look at is this carbon labeled A right here, and let me pull up a red pin here. So this carbon labeled A, let's see how it, what its structure really is. So we have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen bonded to an OH, so that's a carboxylic acid, and then it's bonded to a carbon that has an OH on it, okay? So all we're talking about is this A carbon, and then this carbon has two other carbons on it, okay? So that's what A looks like if we just drew it out with just that thing. Okay, the reason I wanted to draw it out that way is because the carbon next to it, the D carbons here, you might say, oh, look, we have a carbon with two oxygens and a hydrogen on it, so these might be the same, okay? However, 
These are bonded to a CH2 right here, okay? This is not bonded to a CH2, which means this carbon, this first carboxylic acid group is different than the two other groups because this is not, this is only bonded to a carbon but with no hydrogens on it. See how each of these has a carbon bonded to, with uh, two hydrogens on it here? So that makes these the same as each other, but they are different. They are not the same as that one, okay? Do we see how we're looking at that same bond-bond connections? And because of the lack of hydrogens on this carbon here, that these have to be different carbons. Now notice, on carbon A, carbon D, and, and, and the two carbon Ds, we don't have hydrogen bond directly to this, meaning that that particular carbon would not show up in proton NMR because there's no hydrogen on there, okay? But it shows up in carbon NMR, and we have two different ones that'll show up in the carbon NMR, okay? So now that I think I've convinced you that A and D are two different carbons, even though they look like they have the same functional group, they have a different connectivity. Let's go to the next set right here. Let's look at the, these two right here, this CH2 and this CH2. Now they're both labeled B, and that's because if we looked at the connections this way, we have a carbon with two hydrogens bonded to a carbon and then bonded to a carbonyl. If we look at the bonding here, we have the exact same thing on this side here. So both of the CH2s in this compound are identical in the fact that they have the same bond connections, okay? So that, in theory, should make the, us understand that uh, A is different than D and Bs are the same. Now, C, right here, our last one, is also unique because there is no other carbon on this system bonded to three other carbons and an oxygen. Therefore, it is different than the others, okay? So that being said, now we have a total of one, two, three, four types of carbons, okay? So in carbon NMR, we only have to worry about two things, position and number of carbons, all right? So that being said, let's think about using that same shift rule we learned from proton NMR, and that's the shift moves away from zero, from away from that trimethylsilane functionality, moves away from zero as you add more electron density or something with more electron density to it, okay? So um, that being said, let's kind of rank these in order of which are gonna be the closest to zero and which are gonna be further away from zero, okay? So the, let's start with A, and effectively we have on that one, we have a carbon with a bond to oxygen, and then we also have a second bond to oxygen, a third bond to oxygen here, and then a bond to carbon, okay? So that being said, that's going to be pretty far away from zero because it's literally bonded to oxygen three different times, okay? Now, that would be the same for this one as well. We have a carbon with an oxygen and a, a bonded to another here, so that these two are going to be pretty close to each other and gonna be very far downfield in this direction here, okay? But to figure out which one's gonna be further away, we have to look at the next bond over. So I'm gonna, um, look at the connections on the next bond over here. So if all of these groups are going to be shifted over to the far left of the field because of it being bonded to so many oxygens, let's look at the next one over. This one here has a CH2. This one here has a CH2. So they're gonna be shifted. These two are gonna be shifted about the same amount. But this one has a C with no hydrogens on it and another electronegative out, okay? 
So I think this one now is gonna be shifted further than the other two because it's proximity to another carbon without hydrogens on it that has this electronegative thing. So if we were to rank the, just these carboxylic acids here, I would rank these as um, this one right here is gonna be the furthest downfield. And then these two are gonna be the second furthest down that way right here because of the number of bonds and connections they have. Okay, so now that's those first two sets, those first two kinds of carbons, okay? Let's look at the other two kinds of carbons here, okay? So based, just comparing this carbon and this carbon, okay, which ha looks more like that methyl group that we would see at zero, okay? We have a carbon with two hydrogens on it and we have a carbon with an oxygen and three carbons on it. So of those two, this one is gonna be further down that direction than this one, okay? Because this is the closest to that CH3 that would appear at zero. So that makes in order of priority, this is gonna be our third most shifted downfield and our fourth most shifted downfield because it's most like that methyl group. Okay, so that being said, let's look at our spectrum here and look where they show up, okay? So in this case here, if we look, let me blow up this side here. This is zero, of course, this is our um, TMS to tell us that we have our material there. Now it turns out the solvent itself occasionally shows up and it sh they typically show up as a unique structure. And so the fact that we can see that and we identify that as a solvent, so we don't worry about that peak there. That's just what we dissolved our material in to get our solution, to get our, uh, our sample run, okay? So if we blow up the entire thing, based on the types of carbons, we said that there were four types of carbons and we do see four peaks. So that's great. That is consistent with what we saw, what we did. Now let's figure out where we think they are based on that shift, just by what's bonded to them. So according to this right here, our A is shifted most upfield, which is what we predicted, that it would be shifted furthest away from being a methyl group, okay? And it says D here is our next most shifted, which we predicted based on the fact that it had the same kind of oxygen bonding to it, but it was bonded to CH2. So it's less shifted upfield than the one that was bonded to that, to the uh, OH right here. So, so then our, la our next one over would be level C, which uh, has showing up as further away from zero than number B, which is what we predicted our last one to be, okay? So just based on the idea of how many electron-rich things are bonded to our atom that we're looking at, we have predicted the relative species on where they would be in the shift of our carbon NMR. Okay, we use that exact same rule in hydrogen NMR. The more electron uh, rich things bonded to it, the more it's gonna be shifted to the left. And we can get a relative position just by looking at that, okay? So let's look at the whole thing again. And if we look at the uh, samples here, we have these uh, carboxylic acids shifted way up here. And they're all shifted above 150, which is way high up here. And then these are the ones that are closer to being like our methyl group that are further downfield. Okay, so <clears throat> we're using the same strategy for predicting our shift, our relative position of our shift, and we're using our same strategy of trying to figure out which carbons are different by their connections through other bonds, okay? so. Uh, the only thing we're doing now is instead of looking at the hydrogens and whether there's hydrogens next to it that'll split, we don't worry about that because we're only looking at the carbons and we've 
have, we were running the experiment such that the carbons don't split and the hydrogens don't split the carbons. So we've simplified our task. Okay, so that being said, let's go ahead and look at some relative ranges of where we'd find things. So things that are like methyl groups, sp3 hybridized carbons, whether they're primary, secondary, tertiary, uh, they're more like this CH3 group. So they're the shifted furthest down, okay? Now, once we add an electronegative atom, something that it has electron density on it, we now shift it up, okay? Then above that, we now have our sp2 hybridized carbons. Because think about that, where a carbon double bonded to a carbon, typically, or a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, okay? So, but in, in no, I'm sorry, these are alkenes. So we're looking at things that are just double bonded to other carbons here. So we've added the electron rich nature of the pi bond. That's what's shifting it up. So the, pi, yes. So when it says uh, tertiary is greater than secondary, which is greater than primary carbons for the sp3 carbons, are yeah. you saying that tertiary is further downfield than secondary? Yes. Or is yeah, think of the primary as the most like the methyl group, and therefore it's gonna be closest to zero. So a carbon with three hydrogens on it is gonna be closer to zero than a carbon with two hydrogens on it. And a carbon with two hydrogens on it is gonna be a secondary carbon, okay? And okay. that means a tertiary carbon is gonna be one with three carbon bonds onto it, and therefore it's going to have only one hydrogen on it, and it's shifted even further away from methyl. So yes, that was exactly correct. Okay, uh, upfield, downfield, that's a good question. So the idea is that things to the left are downfield, okay? Things to the right are upfield. Okay, think of it as uh, downfield is getting to higher numbers. You're going further away from home plate, so you're going away from it, so you're going downfield. Okay, all right, so let's continue this uh, strategy of thinking about it just from an electron uh, donation perspective. Uh, the next thing up here is a carbonyl group with a carboxylic acid. Okay, no, so that's a carbon double bonded with an OH is up the next highest. And then the only thing above that would be a carbonyl with either a carbon bonded to it, two carbons bonded to it, or a carbonyl bonded with one hydrogen and one carbon on it. Okay, so this is our ketone and this is our aldehyde. Okay, so those are the only two that are shifted down from, <laughs> from that. And that has a little bit more to do, that, that's a subtle difference from what I've explained it as so far. But if you just remember that the carboxylic acids are just below the aldehydes and ketones, but you're looking at that carbon double bonded to an oxygen. And that's the carbon that's the one that's way high, is the one that's double bonded to the oxygens right here. Okay, so do you see that just following that general rule of relative positioning, we're going to get these things pretty much racked and stacked in the correct order? Okay, so that being said, let's go ahead and predict a few of these proton signals. I'm mean, sorry, uh, carbon uh, uh, signals just based on the structure and how close they are to a methyl group, all right? So if we look at this one, let's redraw this. This is, I like to have us, whenever we have a structure, I think drawing it, redrawing it as a stick structure is going to help us because it'll, it'll kind of simplify things. So we're only looking for uh, the, 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 the actual outline of it. We have O, right here. So this is just redrawing that exact same compound here. And when I redraw it here, that makes it simpler to figure out how many different kinds of carbons we have. Okay, because the carbon right here, number one, 
is not the same as the carbon over here, number two, because carbon number one is not bonded to an oxygen. It is bonded to a carbonyl group though, okay? So one and two are definitely different and that makes the carbonyl number three, okay? So are there any other carbons in the structure? The answer is no. That's why the simplified stick structure tells us that it, all those in, you know, vertices, those, those endpoints and those uh, angles are where the carbons are. Everything else is a hydrogen or an already labeled atom, okay? So we can see by just simply redrawing the structure that we have three compounds. Um, and based on the, the rule here, I think one would be the furthest up field, followed by two, followed by three. Because remember, three is a carbonyl with an oxygen bended on it. So from zero to 180, they're gonna be ranked in that order, okay? So we're just predicting number of signals, but I'm also, I think we can figure out the relative position as well. All right, so let me erase that line. All right, and let's do the same thing on this one here. Let's redraw this compound as the stick structure to help simplify it for us. Um, now, when we're looking at the stick figure and just identifying which carbon we're talking about, that no assignment is just random. It's starting from one side to the other or whatever. It doesn't matter as long as, in fact, we could label them A, B, C, and D because then they can be different orders when we actually look at position. Here, we're just trying to predict the number of signals, so I'm using numbers. So, but yeah, the, the, the assignments I'm using here are just random. On this next one, I'll just use A, B, C, and D to tell us the different types, okay? All right. Uh, um, the, does it follow electronegativity trends? Yes. Uh, like, but it's not, it, let's see. Yes, it does follow neg electronegativity trends. So oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. Therefore, it's going to shift it even more. So yes, it does. All right, so the first, uh, again, is redrawing this. So we have one, two, three, four, five carbons total. So I'm gonna draw my five carbon chain and our carbonyl is on the second one over from here, okay? Um, yes, farthest left and farthest uh, up on the corner uh, is the most electronegative atom. So fluorine is your most electronegative atom and then it goes down as you go to the other end of the um, periodic table. All right, so we have one, two, three, four, five carbons we need to assign as A, B, C, and D, okay? So, but we need to make sure that they're all different, okay? Because if they're the same, like if we have symmetry, we need to make sure that we know that they're the same so that we don't have, we're not looking for more peaks than we should have. So let's look at, let's just assign them um, A, B, C, D, and E, and let's just make sure they're all different, okay? So A and E are both CH3s. However, are they the same, okay? One, a is bonded to a carbon with two hydrogens on it, and E is bonded to a carbon with a double bond, carbonyl. That means A and E are not the same, okay? So they should have unique uh, signals for each A and E. Now, if we look at B and C, B and C are both CH2s bonded to other carbons. So we have to see whether or not they're the same. So B is bonded to a CH3 and C is bonded to a C double bond O, okay? So a CH3 is not the same as a C double bond O, therefore B and C are also unique uh, signals. And that leads to D. D is the only one with the, uh, with the carbon double bonded to an oxygen, therefore it is unique. And therefore we should see five signals for this compound, okay? Because A and E are not the same, even though they're both methyl groups. B and C are the same, are not the same, even though they're both CH2 groups, they have different things bonded to them. And then D of course is the only one with the carbon oxygen double bond. Okay, and so if we were to do a relative ranking, uh, let's see, A would be the most 
downfield, I'm sorry, upfield because of the, um, uh, the fact that it's most like a methyl group. Okay, and let's see, so that would be A, then B and C would be the next two because they're, no, B would be next because it doesn't have a, a, a carbon double bond next to it. So then we'd have to compare C and E. C has three hydrogens on it, so it's more methyl-like than C. So between C and E, E would be the next one up, and then C would be there, and then D would be last. So if we were looking for relative order based on how close it was to the CH3 group and how, what it's bonded to otherwise, I think we would get a decent, that would give us a decent idea about where those ones would be predicted. So there are five different signals because they're all different and they would be in that same relative order. Okay, now, Here's where I'm going to show you why symmetry is important and why drawing the line structure out is important too. Because right here, this is an isomer of this, okay? All we've done is move the CH, uh, the C double bond O over. So we're going to draw that same stick drawing here. And here's where we start seeing carbons are going to start looking like other carbons, okay? So using our blue here, A and B, those are obviously different because we have a CH3 and a CH2. And then this is obviously different because of that. Now, if I were to label this D right here, it starts to look like B. So we need to compare B and D here. Now, if we look at D, we have it carbonyl on one side, methyl group on the other. If we look at B, we have carbonyl on one side, methyl group on the other. Those are exactly the same bond connections which means B and D are the same carbon and are only gonna have a single signal. Now let's look at what would have been E over here. If we have E, that is, looks a lot like A, so we need to compare E and A. And we have A is connected to a CH2, which is connected to a carbonyl, a C double bond O. Uh, we have E is a CH3 connected to a CH2, a, a connected to a carbonyl it has the same connections, okay? Which means it has the same electronic environment, which means it is not unique, and we have to see that they're symmetrical. So in the case of this compound here, we're only gonna have three peaks. Even though there are a total of five carbons in the compound, the fact that B and this position and A and this position are electronically the same because of the connections and because they're exactly the same group, they only show up as, a, um, at, as that same symmetrical compound. Therefore, there are only three peaks available to us. All right, so do you see the difference between B and C? Just that little break in symmetry is enough to make all of those carbons unique and show up in the spectrum. And having symmetry makes them start to be duplicitous, look exactly the same, and therefore overlap each other and only have one peak for them. Okay, 16, all right, great. All right, so let's go to our last one right here. And we're gonna look at, this is basically a full table of the chemical shifts. But what I want you to see is the general places these show up, okay? Because what we're looking at is that, that general trend of, you know, so we can just predict relatively where they are. So CH3, CH2, and CH are the first set coming away from zero, okay? So that's kind of what we predicted here. Now, if we look at just the halogens here, we have iodine, which is the least negative, is shifted less than chlor bromine, which is shifted less than chlorine. Notice how as our electronegativity increases, our shift increases, 
okay? And that is because we've replaced one hydrogen with that electronegative element, and that halogen is shifting us further down field. Okay, how do you know the difference between whether you have a proton NMR or a carbon NMR? The first thing you can do to make sure that you know which is which is look at the bottom, look at the PPMs, okay? If the shifts are only from zero to 10, you're, you're looking at a hydrogen NMR. If the shift is from zero to 200, you're looking at a carbon NMR. The other thing you'll notice is in the hydrogen NMRs, you typically have some kind of intensity bar on it and or splitting. Carbons will tend to only have single lines. So those two things should help you tell the difference between a proton NMR and a carbon NMR very rapidly. Okay? All right, I'm gonna continue on my uh, electronegativity thing here. So once we switched out a halogen for an oxygen, notice that has about the same electronegativity as chlorine, and we have about the same shift field. Look at that, the chlorine is about the same electronegativity as an oxygen, and therefore our shifts are the same, okay? Now, once we get to a triple bond, that kind of changes things a little bit because we've shifted up some, but the fact that we are sp hybridized means we're not shifting as much as if we were sp2 hybridized. So notice these are sp hybridized because of the triple bond, and these are sp2. sp2 allows a little more electrons to stay on the atom, and therefore it's actually slightly higher. And notice when we alternate single and double bonds, we're approximating the same shift as if you had a regular double bond. So 100 and 150 to 110. So a benzene ring is about the same place as an alkene would be, okay? Now, once we start adding a carbonyl and we have electron like nitrogens and oxygens attached to them, their shill shifted fairly high Right here, this has an OH, this has an OR, and this has a nitrogen right here. However, if you take that electronegative atom away and just have the carbonyls, they are our highest shift. Notice it's 180 to 200, and the upper end of all of these is about 180. So that's the big break from the system, but just look at those functional groups. They follow that trend most of the time, actually all the time. Okay, so that's what I want you to learn about carbon NMR, okay? So proton NMR, you have four things to look for. You're looking for number of peaks, position of peaks, intensity of peaks, and the splitting. Carbon, all we care about is number of peaks and position. Okay, questions on that? Okay, I have one other question up here in the chat that I wanna discuss before we uh, bow out. Um, is there a good way to be able to remember how to visualize the steps in the benzene reactions as if you were drawing them in stick diagrams step by step? Uh, okay, that's a really good question and it's going to be on the exam this week. So let me uh, get to a area with, let's see, benzene reactions should be in nine but I don't think I have a mechanism on this. I want two. Okay, so in all of our benzene reactions, okay, in all of our benzene reactions, we all follow the exact same mechanisms. There's three steps that it's gonna happen, okay? And those, those three steps are in the same every single time. The first thing we have to do is we have to generate a positive charge, okay? We have three ways of doing that. Okay, we can make a carbocation by using a Lewis acid catalyst, and so aluminum chloride. Okay, that makes a carbocation for both the alkylation and the acylation. Okay, so the other thing we can do is use a Lewis acid catalyst with a halide. When we use a Lewis acid catalyst with a halide, it's usually iron trichloride or iron tribromide. Okay and that creates a positive uh, bromine or a positive chlorine, okay? The last way we do it is with an acid catalyst and a dehydration, where we protonate a nitric acid and turn it into an N plus, or we protonate uh, our sulfuric acid, turn it into an S plus, 
to make that react. Okay, so that's the first step is always that generation of that positive charge. And we have three ways to do it. Aluminum, chloride to make carbocations. We have iron halides to make halo compounds, X pluses. And we have acid to generate NSO2 plus and NO. NO2 plus. Okay, so that's step one. This next step is always the electrons from the benzene ring reaching out and forming a new sigma bond with that positive charge. This is the nucleophile electrophile reaction. We form a new sigma bond <clears throat> and we just kind of move that uh, plus charge around the ring. Okay, then to re aromatize because we get so much energy from aromatizing. The next step is to lose the proton on the atom where the electrophile has just formed its new bond. That way we get that carbon back to sp2 hybridized and we re-aromatize the ring. And so that's always step three is that removing the proton from the atom the electrophile is now attached to to re-aromatize the ring. Okay. So when we visualize the steps in benzene reactions, we do the same three steps every single time. We have three different catalysts to do it. We have an acid catalyst. Uh, we have a Lewis acid catalyst, <coughs> which is aluminum chloride or iron chloride or iron bromide. We can also do it with a very strong acid. There are some like phosphoric acid and sulfuric acid can also be used to make carbocations. Okay. So, there's that. And then for making nitrogen, nitro groups or, sul, or sulfide groups on there, we always use really strong acids and go through a dehydration step to give us our positively charged nitrogen or a positively charged sulfur. Okay, does that clarify the steps in electrophilic aromatic substitution? You just need to start to look for the, um, the you know, the actual steps, if you look at each and every one of these molecules, they all follow the same steps. And that's what the great thing about this system is you get all these different functional groups from exactly the same mechanism. Okay, so making the electrophile, making the electrophile, making the electrophile. So, and that's the last one we did where we actually made the carbocation with a very strong acid. That's the only one that's a little different from the previous. Ooh, all right. So the last question I wanna answer before we break out is that, um, uh, let's see, let, uh, yes, it does, okay. Right, so when, when you're looking at a molecule that, uh, and you're thinking about ortho pair direction, what you're wanting to look at is where is the positive charge going to be most stable? Okay, that's what when in that intermediate here, where is this positive charge going to be most stable? <clears throat> and so, what you really are going to try to do is avoid having your positive charge show up on something that already has a positive charge. Like on a nitro group here, this actually has a partially positive charge on that nitro group. So having that positive charge next to a positive charge, they repulse each other. And so that's why the nitro group is a meta director because if this uh, reached out and grabbed this, it would make a positive charge on that group that is next to that nitrogen. So that means it doesn't want to be there. So it wants to be at least anywhere that doesn't form that carbocation. And notice that our meta position here, okay, this position never has the ring stabilized cation in that position. If that, that is telling us that anything that has a partially positive charge, you know, SO3, nitrogen, even a carbonyl, has a partially positive charge. So if anything's in this meta position, that means that cation can go around the ring 
and not avoid it. So that's why those things that are partially positive with positive charge are always meta directors because we don't want those two positive charges next to each other if at all possible. Okay? Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and close this out and go ahead and post this. We ran a little long, but that's okay. Uh, let's go ahead and stop.